Throughout the 1930s, Universal Pictures became the studio known for monster movies. Dracula, Frankenstein, The Mummy, The Wolfman, The Invisible Man, and many other beloved monsters dominated the horror genre throughout the decade. But among these monster movies, Universal also produced stranger but equally entertaining horror films about human beings doing unspeakable things to each other. <laughs> In 1932, James Whale essentially created the old dark house subgenre with his hilarious and creepy movie of the same name. And in 1935, Lou Landers directed a truly unhinged film starring Bella and Boris about a deranged man with an Edgar Allan Poe obsession who had transformed his home into a torture chamber. <laughs> <laughs> Join me as we continue exploring the evolution of home invasion and we discuss Universal's The Old Dark House and The Raven. Have a potato. Welcome back to the evolution of horror. My name is Mike Munzer, and as ever, I am your host. In this podcast, we explore and dissect the history and the evolution of the horror genre, one subgenre at a time. We are currently in the middle of our ninth series, exploring the evolution of home invasion, and this is part two. In this week's episode, as that intro suggested, we are going to be discussing two universal 30s classics, The Old Dark House from 1932 and The Raven from 1935. Both of these discussions will be spoilerific, so please do give both films a watch before you listen to our discussion. So joining me to discuss these two vintage classics, uh, he is the expert when it comes to all horror movies made over 80 years ago. Um, he is a longtime friend of the pod. He was last here in our vampire series to discuss Nosferatu and Vampire with me. And it sounds like he's back. Let's get the door. James Swanton, hello. Hello, Mike. How are you? Very well, thank you. Lovely to see you. Welcome to my home. Come on in, take your shoes off. Mm, <laughs> nice in here. Patreon must be going well, Mike. <laughs> it's going well, James. Oh, it's going well. I've you upgraded. You freelancers. <laughs> I know, right? Um, oh. It's so lovely to have you here, James. So tell me, it's been a while since we last chatted. How are you? How have you been? I'm okay. I, I had the most manic year of my life last year and yes. full of projects I'm still not allowed to talk about so that's incredibly interesting for the purposes of a podcast where information <laughs> is disseminated for the interest of its listeners um, what, what have I done that I can talk about um, I know this is the problem because you've done all this exciting oh, stuff gosh. but you're sort of bound and gagged legally aren't you this is the problem yes no I'm, I'm, I'm just motoring away doing various macabre little screen projects so I, I, I did a nice short horror film in January called The Dead of Winter which is sort of part Lawrence Gordon Clark and part Charles Dickens as a kind of ghost story for Christmas. Ooh, so I'm, excellent. I'm rather excited about that. Um, I'm currently learning lines for a folk horror film, which is either a short feature or a very long short, based on which way you slice it. Um, yeah, bits, bits and pieces. So let me ask you, I want to ask you your thoughts on kind of home invasion. Um, and we are sort of, we're covering mm. home invasion this series and sort of various different sort of versions and variations, I suppose, of home invasion. Um, it's, it, I find it really interesting, you know, the, the sort of reaction from listeners when I announced this, you know, a lot of people sort of said, oh God, this is <laughs> the scariest uh, and for some people, the most triggering subgenre and yeah. the most frightening. What do you, what do you think of it, James? What are your thoughts on kind of home invasion i'm I, I should probably preface this by saying that for anyone who is worried about this being a terribly intense subgenre the two films we're going to discuss <laughs> today they're not what i would call traditional home invasion stories no, um no. they're probably closer to the uncanny which is yeah marvelous because as i'm sure mary wilde has already said or will get around to saying the word uncanny comes from unheimlich exactly. which means unhomely um so so yeah the, the homes in these two particular universal horror classics um are homes which are kind of rendered adventurous and strange and yet they are weirdly comforting um these films to me are like the cinem cinematic equivalent of uh, reading ghost stories by a fire in a storm mm -hmm. um when it comes to the serious the heavy home invasion stuff um 
Yeah, it's um, it's a hell of a thing, isn't it? It's all very much about the blurring of boundaries, and of course, homes are meant to provide us with boundaries, um, physical barriers, but um, also personal barriers and personal protections. And this subgenre specialises in breaking down those barriers wantonly and unforgivingly, and safe spaces become dangerous spaces, and yes. what we see as refuges become prisons and um yes mm, it's all very very murky it, especially that thing about physical boundaries being eroded turning into situations where personal boundaries are eroded that is particularly terrifying it is really terrifying have you ever had anything like that happen to you in real life james like a break in no, or anything no. like that I, I i've been very very fortunate um the most trauma I can muster up to talk about in this context is the very superficial trauma of being an actor who sometimes has to secure digs when on tour. Um, yes. And the relationship you have with your host in most situations is... Um, I've, I've never really cracked it. I'm, it. It's very much a case of pot luck, because certain people who host actors on tour, they, they understand very well the need for boundaries. Others really don't. Um... So it's it's one of those relationships that it's very hard to clearly define. Yes, yes. That's such a good point, actually. I hadn't really thought about that. The, the idea of kind of, you know, these days staying in a in an Airbnb, for example, or a traditional B&B that is, you know, staying in somebody's a, a bedroom in somebody's house, often mm. with sort of, mm. you know, no actual boundaries in terms of like no lock oh, on the indeed. door or indeed. whatever it might be, you know, some of those more kind of old school traditional little B&Bs or whatever. And I suppose that is a kind of, you are suddenly plonked in some, in a stranger's home and that can be quite unnerving yeah. yes and I'm, I'm yet to evolve a strategy that really gives me peace of mind in these situations um uh, i mean i mean usually i just devolve into becoming a sort of room gremlin or a ghost in someone's house but that that makes me <laughs> feel like an intruder or an invader um and that that's not really right because a financial transaction has taken place yes, um, a service yes. uh, should be provided but i i suppose again mike it does come down to this blurring between well, well, the the blurring of boundaries, and therefore the blurring between what constitutes a house versus a home. I mean, yeah. Yeah. you know, if if you're not running a hotel, if you're running digs in a house, um, you know, you're 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 inviting someone into your home. Yeah, and and you know, our homes are extensions of ourselves. Um, and we're about to see in these two films that the homes absolutely reflect the insanity of their owners. Yeah, so. Yes, there's, there's, there's also that thing where there's that instability as to who is doing the invading. Yes. So, you know, on, on, on the level of actors, digs, or Airbnbs or whatever, um, we are violating their space. They're sort of violating my space. It's, um, yeah. it's, it's very, very difficult to get a handle on who is being the invasive party here i mean psycho is the film i come to as the kind of ultimate example of mm -hmm. the home invasion film and and that's perfect for getting at these blurred boundaries because you have the hotel on the one hand don't you mm. the temporary home of anyone who stays there and then you have up on the hill the bates mansion which is the home of norman bates yeah and and the, these these are spaces where the victim and the offender are reversed constantly yes um, so, so Norman Bates invades the safe space, or what should be the safe space of the hotel, whether he's peering through the walls or uh, brutally stabbing someone in the shower. I apologise to anyone who's not seen Psycho, but I found a good, <laughs> yes. a good, um, <laughs> a good sixty-three years to get round to it by now. So, for God's sake, hurry up! Um, and then, on the other hand, you have Norman Bates's house, which, in the course of the investigation into the murders, has to be invaded by the authorities. Yes. Um, so it's a yeah, it's it's a very destabilizing arena yeah and i think it's going to be interesting to see how much this subgenre changes in the wake of covid and lockdowns and isolation the fact that we've all been confined to our homes for the best part of three years right and how that's going to affect the genre well i mean i, mean, I probably have a fairly warped perspective on all of that anyway because of the experience of doing host yes in the first uk lockdown so i mean i <laughs> I don't, I don't want to big myself up, but I suppose I am the personification of lockdown home invasion. <laughs> or, or was yes. for, you know, the four, the four or five seconds I 
featured in the film that's um, so true yeah by playing the kind of uh, monster in host you sort of invaded all of our homes that summer right <laughs> yes and i don't know certainly from my perspective doing it that experience was it, it felt rather a microcosm of the perils of internet engagement in these plague times because i was however unconventionally working from home and i was sort of oversharing well, well, I was encountering the risk of oversharing bits of my life because yeah. I was literally filming in my family home. I was I was staying with my mum, my dad, and my brother mm-hmm. during the first lockdown, and um, it's it's very very peculiar for me to watch, especially the first scene where the demon appears in host because it's on just the stairs sort of near my bedroom and going up to my brother's bedroom oh wow and because the camera had to move i i corralled my poor mum, who's a complete technophobe and hates doing anything of this kind <laughs> i had to corral my poor mother into walking up those stairs and you know filming her son with his face painted blue <laughs> appearing from behind a banister over and over and over again one night with my dad probably in the next room Drowning his sorrows in red wine, thinking, oh, Christ, he's been at this for 25 years, a quarter of a bloody century, painting himself colours and pretending to be spooks. Get a proper job. Yes. Um, but then, of course, when that film blew up in the way it did, because none of us expected it to, it was odd to reflect that ah, a bit of my home is now being seen globally. And it's even in the trailer. And Stephen King has seen those stairs. Wow, and, yeah. Um, uh, I mean, I mean that's that's a more innocent and more fun side of things. It's a it's a great sort of bragging right that my mum can say she helped to film an internationally screened and successful feature film in her lockdown, rather than you know just uh, staring out the window and going for that one hour walk. Yeah, but, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's <laughs> but, really interesting. Um, I forgot that obviously that it was actually your home that it, mm, it, and in all of your homes in terms of actors on that film, you know, that actually featured there. So yeah, there is a kind of two way yeah. two way home invasion there in the way that we were all oh, watching entirely, you, but we were entirely. all in your homes. You yes, yeah, yeah. The um the division between invader and invading or invaded is um. Yeah. It's uh, it's a very, very fine one. I love it. Well, that's a good uh, segue into the first film that we're going to discuss, James. Uh, let's talk about the incredible The Old Dark House from 1932. What is it? What do they want? They want to know if they can stay here for the night. Shelter. They've been caught in the storm. Of course they can't stay. We can't have them here. But we only but it's it's pouring down our turrets. Go on. You see, there's a landslide. Half the mountain seems to be crumbling. It only just missed us. The road's blocked behind us, and I'm pretty sure it's blocked in front as well. We hate to intrude, but what else can we do? You see, there isn't anywhere else we can go. Even the road below is underwater, and for that matter, this place itself may be underwater pretty soon, or even buried. (coughs) Do you hear what he said? There's a landslide and floods. The lake has burst its banks. We're trapped. We're trapped. We've got to go. You hear? We've got to go. And you're afraid, Horace. You're afraid, aren't you? You don't believe in God, and yet you're afraid to die. You've seen his anger in the sky and you've heard him in the night. And you're afraid, afraid, afraid. Where's your mocking now? You may well be afraid. Your time will come. But it hasn't come yet. This house is safe. I know it better than you. Morgan! Welcome to beautiful, rural, idyllic Wales, where you are to be a guest of the ancestral mansion of the Fem dynasty. Different things matter here in this simpler part of the world. You can spend time considering whether you want pickled onions to eat with your potatoes. (laughs) For you must have a potato! (laughs) Or you could spend some time arguing with Mr Horace Femme on the landing about whether you want to get a lamp from upstairs or not. He doesn't. I don't know why. Or perhaps you could decide which chair to sleep on. Because, as Rebecca Femme, one of the proprietors, will constantly remind you, there are, most definitely, NO BEDS! <laughs> Just be sure to avoid the drunken butler, Morgan, and uh, also that little man locked away at mm. the top of the house. <laughs> Fantastic. I love this. Uh, well, there's so much to discuss, even based on that short synopsis you gave me, James. But let me start off by asking you, <laughs> what do you think of this film? And give me give me a bit of your own history with this film. Well, this particular film was rather tantalisingly harder to see than a lot of the major universal mm-hmm. horror films um, for some time. Um 
partly because um, the rights no longer reside with Universal, so they weren't going to release it in any of their yes. big horror slash monster box sets up and down the years, and because Universal lost the rights, this film very nearly became entirely lost because they had absolutely no incentive to preserve it or keep a copy that could be screened. So um, this this film was very, very nearly lost to time. Yeah. Um, now, we did eventually in the UK get a DVD from Network in the late 2000s. And that was a very, very battered, sort of disintegrating print. Not Not unsuited to this quite murky film this kind of murky world that the old dark house unfolds in but um uh, a beautiful new restoration has now been done from a beautiful newly struck print and it's now on blu-ray and it's 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 a stunning film to behold it looks as though it was shot yesterday Mm. and that's pretty extraordinary for something that's now 91 years old um so yeah it it was a long time before i could see the old dark house and I think I appreciated it all the more for having had to wait for such a long time. This this film is extraordinarily funny, extraordinarily sophisticated. It's appealingly theatrical. I'd, I've 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 always sort of nursed an idea that I'd quite like to do a stage version of this, and yet I don't believe it would fully work on stage, because this is also a very very cinematic film. It never feels stagey, which is pretty remarkable given it unfolds in a couple of rooms for the most part. Yeah, I I, I love this film. I I really do. And although it's very, very funny, I, I find it kind of oddly moving as well. Mm. Um, I, I love spending time with this very strange group of people. <laughs> They're all strange. Even the normal characters are strange. <laughs> They're all a bit broken and they, they come together for a night and they're all transformed by the experience in some way. Yeah. Um, there's, there's, there's a line in J.B. Priestley's novel, Benighted, on which this film is based, and it, um, I only read it very recently in preparation for this podcast, and there's a line in it which hits nail on the head exactly how I feel about this film, and it, it, it goes like this, um, saying that they had found some people like themselves, only twisted, crazed, with loneliness, age, some weakness of blood or brain. Um, mm. Yeah, I, I find it weirdly touching, this yes. film. But it's also very, very entertaining, very, very funny, a great crowd pleaser, a, a, a fantastic spook show. I, I love it. And I know you love this film too. Oh, I love it so much. It is, for my money, I, I would say it's up there for me with Bride of Frankenstein as my favourite but favorite horror movie of the 1930s ge- generally like that I, is entirely fair yeah entirely i fair. i love it so much I, I like everything that you said i think it's it's it is almost stagey but it's so cinematic i think i think the cinematography mm. is gorgeous i love every single weird performance in this film every single character <laughs> like you said i just want to spend more time with most of them as well yes, uh, yeah yeah it's just and it is just endlessly entertaining it's so much fun it whizzes by in a flash as well it's just mm. brilliant how how did you first come to this film Mike? very recently uh well relatively recently yes. probably about five or six years ago there was a restoration um and, and the bfi were playing it on the big screen so i took the opportunity oh. to to go and see it in nft1 at the bfi so that maybe that has something to do with my love for it because i, I always think watching a film for the first time you know in an environment like that is always so wonderful and adds to the experience i think but oh, i so i watched it i watched it on the big screen at the bfi and i with a whole audience and we all laughed and were just thoroughly entertained i yeah Marvelous. so so it's 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 relatively recently for me yes um yeah. and since then i've probably seen it three or four times and it just uh, it just gets better and better oh it does it does so yeah. lots yeah. to discuss james where to even begin oh, um, <laughs> why don't we start let's talk about this being a universal horror movie. Now, this came out in 1932. Obviously, the year earlier, we'd had the, the beginning of the boom of the universal monster era, Dracula and Frankenstein. Of course, Frankenstein directed by James Whale. Um, how does this movie fit in with the rest of the universal movies from the 1930s? Does it feel akin to those other films or is it sort of an anomaly? I think it's most definitely an anomaly, but it is worth saying that there was no such thing as a cookie-cutter universal horror film at this point. There was no scientific formula Mm. for 
concocting one because you know partly because there really haven't been many universal horror films up to this point and partly because the real formula setting came in the 1940s when the universal horror films became much more assembly line much more child friendly um b films right yeah so it, it doesn't quite fit in with anything that had gone before i mean it is worth saying that most of the previous universal horror films had had strong home invasion elements um if if you go back to the silent era you have the two great lon cheney proto universal horror films the hunchback of notre dame and the phantom of the opera Mm. both of those revolve around the abductions of young women to parisian monuments that are also the homes of these very human monsters played by lon cheney and um dracula and frankenstein of course both team with home invasion elements where the difference between invader and invaded is switched and reversed again and again and uh, yeah apart from dracula and frankenstein universal's only talking horror film up to this point was their adaptation of edgar Allan poe's murders in the Rue morgue um which carries over the home invasion element from poe's story there's an ape that breaks into people's homes and in the case of the Universal film, abducts the heroine. Yes. Uh, it's, almost, it's almost a dry run for King Kong, in a way. Mm-hmm. But, um, yeah, I mean, The Old Dark House, at least stylistically, is closest, without doubt, to The Cat and the Canary, the silent film by Paul Lenny. Mm. But the, the marvellous thing that this film does is it dispenses with all of the plot complication for you find in the cat and the canary if 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 you're not giving the cat and the canary your full attention you can lose the thread there's quite a lot going on there are lots of characters and uh, there's the time-tested fortune hunting narrative which propels everyone along and mm. you 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 spend a lot of time as well trying to guess who the guilty party is um Almost nothing of significance happens in the old dark house. <laughs> no. um, I, I I often wonder if that's why people are so keen to label this film camp. I'm, uh, yeah, I'm 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 always very attached to an interview Kenneth Williams gave where he was asked to define camp, and uh, his answer is I still think one of the ultimate answers to that question, which is a uh, camp is that which is fundamentally frivolous. Mm. This is a fundamentally frivolous film. Yes. Um, yes. It's it's almost a shock when things do ramp up a bit towards the end, and uh, you know something something serious occurs. Yes, because it does feel camp. This film doesn't it? I think you know. However, and I'm never quite sure how I would even define camp in my own head, but it does feel camp to me this film in a glorious way it's it's difficult and possibly because i am gay i have absolutely no perspective on what camp is i mean it's 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 very much in the eye of the beholder as far as i see yeah Um, yeah i'm I'm always a bit reluctant to dub a film camp and i particularly detest words like campy because they're kind of obfuscating and a bit lazy as descriptors um i don't i don't want to know whether it's camp i want to know why you think it's camp i want i want you to unpack that i want you to yeah. You know, uh, open it up a bit. But, um, yeah, I, I think it's perfectly fair to label this film camp. And uh, it, it's bedded into the source material. If if you read J.B. Priestley's Benighted, he's using the word queer on virtually every page. Mm. The way it's come to be understood, that word, in, in the more old-fashioned sense of strange or off-centre or peculiar. Yeah. But, um, you know, the way that word grew to come to mean gay or alternative and uh, yeah, was then yeah. used as a slur and has now been triumphantly reclaimed mm. um i think that is very very applicable to this um extremely grotesque cast <laughs> yes um and we're going to come to the cast of the characters in a moment but let me ask you about james about james whale because you know i i, I believe this is the first time i've actually covered a james whale film so far on this podcast um and well if you hadn't contacted me i'd, I'd have never gone anywhere near this podcast again i'd have been <laughs> furious <laughs> yes exactly tell um, us about him james and you know how important would you say james whale is to the 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 horror genre and the evolution of this genre. James Wells' importance cannot be overstated to the horror film. Yeah. I mean, you said earlier that The Old Dark House is up there with Bride of Frankenstein as your favourite 1930s horror film, mm. and that starts to get at what the problem with 1930s horror cinema is. If, if you're ever trying to compose, for example, a top five of the greatest American horror films of the 1930s, or indeed just the greatest universal horror films, it's very, very frustrating because four of the places are instantly taken by James Wells' horror <laughs> filmography. Yes. When I did my sight and sound list 
last year I, I chose Bride of Frankenstein as one of my top ten of all time, but I could just as easily have gone with Frankenstein or with The Invisible Man or indeed with this film, The Old Dark House, because they're all so, so marvellous. And mm-hmm. some, some people are rather turned off by the comedy elements that um, come to predominate in his films. It's um, one reason why many people prefer Frankenstein to Bride of Frankenstein. Mm. For some people, it's a bit unwholesomely mental. I mean, I mean, I'm all for that, but um, <laughs> yeah, um, I, 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 I always feel Wales comedy does come from a place of authenticity and sincerity. Yeah, I don't know whether that makes it more camp or less camp. I'm really not sure about that. But um, these these elements of humour make all of his horror films rather postmodern now. And um, yeah, I mean, it's it's worth saying as well that. Frankenstein just is classic horror cinema. Mm. You you can't really discuss classic horror cinema until you've seen and re-seen and really appreciated Frankenstein. It, it is classic horror cinema in the way that Hamlet is classical theatre. It may not be a particular person's favourite, but it's this massive thing out there, like a like a mountain range that you have to confront and you have to scale and you have to say, well, what is this thing? Mm. Which is Universal's Frankenstein. And... Without that film, I don't think you would be doing this podcast, Mike, because it wouldn't really be a horror genre to discuss. Yeah. And it it could so easily not have been James Earl's Frankenstein. It was originally to be directed by Robert Florey, who, um, when James Earl expressed an interest in helming Frankenstein, was palmed off with Murders in the Rue Morgue. Now, you look at Murders in the Rue Morgue, it's stylistically beautiful, but it's a complete throwback. It's in love with the cabinet of Dr. Caligari and trying to imitate that sort of aesthetic. Yeah. And no matter how stylistically lush that film is, it's one of the weakest of the initial run of Universal horror films. It's sort of fighting Dracula for the bottom position. <laughs> um, had Robert Florey directed Frankenstein, I truly believe he could have killed classic horror stone dead at the outset. Mm. Frankenstein was the consolidating film. Dracula had been successful, but... Frankenstein was necessary to make horror a proper genre. James Whale is the man who made it so, so we we, we should bow before his image. We should uh, take off our hats to him. He is, um, yeah. Yeah. He is- the father, the father of us all, in, in an odd sort of way. There is something so unbelievably watchable about all of his movies, isn't there? That's the thing. Nin- yes, Ninety years yes. old, they don't feel. They never feel like you have to kind of sit yourself down and go, right, okay, I'm 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 about to watch something made nearly a hundred years ago. You know, like prepare myself for it. Like you might have to yeah, for Dracula, yeah. for example. Like you know the mm. the even it's it's made you know we talked about this before i think but just dracula and frankenstein that came out in the same year the the it's unbelievable how different it is in terms of the language of the filmmaking oh, entirely, you know entirely. everything and, and james whale just seems mm. he just seems to naturally get it doesn't he the language of film and telling a story and it everything down to the the performances the sound design yes. the close ups yes. yeah. the shot compositions the lighting everything is it flows so beautifully Mm. and there is this incredible tone tonal balance there is this tone management isn't there like you said he is a he is brilliant at inserting humor into these films oh yes yes but there is a there is a there is a ba- there's a real horror too, I think, in in a lot of these movies. And the old dark house, I think, is is such a wonderful blend of comedy and horror. You know? Yes, yes, I I fully agree with you. And um, it's interesting. I, I I mentioned earlier that I think central to these home invasion films is the idea of the blurred boundary. So mm. for horror and comedy to be blended and blended well is um, just just another example of that, I suppose. Um, because we've all seen horror co- comedies where they don't mix well, and it's either not very funny, or it's not very scary, or sadly, much more often, it's neither. Yeah. It's not funny, it's yeah. not scary. It doesn't please anyone. Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, I think it's true of this film that the comedy overwhelms the horror a bit. Um, the horror for me comes more in self-contained set piece moments in this um so for example this silver which to me is a remarkably effective jump scare where we see morgan coming towards the kitchen window and smashing his yes. fist through it it's an almost 3d effect it's um it, it really made me jump the first time i saw it i was very very surprised because that is by no means a common thing with films of this vintage um 
And then, of course, you have poor Margaret, who seems to have, by far, of all of the people taking refuge in the old dark house, seems to have, by far, the worst night of anyone there. <laughs> yes. um, because, first of all, she's in Rebecca Femme's room being victimised and inappropriately <laughs> touched and accused of being this lustful red and white woman. And, um, <laughs> and uh, then later on, that, that sort of gets transformed into this waking nightmare she has, where she sees Rebecca's shadow coming towards her in the dining room and touching her again just above the uh, yes. her bust. And, um, yeah, then, then Morgan breaks out and he's chasing after her. So, um, the, you know, when, when the film goes for its horror effects, it's really, really very powerful. Yeah. As I think I said earlier, Whale is sometimes criticised for favouring comedy over horror in the wake of Frankenstein, but... Um, I don't know. I, I I always have this thing where I feel fully appreciating and entering into Wales' mad vision. That becomes rather frightening. It's it's kind of overwhelming. Mm. I mean, Bride of Frankenstein to me is scary in the way something like Alice in Wonderland is scary. Um, it's it's such a bizarre experience. Every every single time I come back to the, that film, it's more insane. <laughs> Than I remember it being. It's almost as though I took it all for granted when I was younger, and now I'm, I'm slowly pulling away from it and seeing it in its true perspective. Yes. And uh, I think some of the same is true of the old Dark House. The more you think about it, the more scary it becomes. Yes, <laughs> yes. Um, but of course, this the form the comedy takes in the old Dark House is so interesting because most prior old Dark House films, and this is certainly true of the silent version of the Cat and the Canary. Um, they're all about slapstick. Mm, mm-hmm. Now, of course, that was that, that had to be true by necessity for the Cat and the Canary because it was a silent film. But um, what, what Whale is able to do here is bring all of his theatrical expertise and experience to bear in making this a, a very heavily verbal comedy. It's all about the bone-dry verbals and the dialogue, this film. Yeah. And it's so wonderful to see an early sound film using sound in such a sophisticated manner. Yes. If you were a woman, you wouldn't talk about only guesses. Ah, the famous old feminine intuition. Does it ever tell you which horse is going to win the derby? No, but it tells me quite a lot about you. I wonder, Mrs. Waverton, whether it happens to tell you that I am wanted by the police. I know, Mr. Fem, it tells me nothing so romantic. After all, can you conceive of anybody living in a house like this if they didn't have to? Well, there's no accounting for tastes, you know. Uh, yes, I, I completely agree with you. It's it's so much about the performances, the dialogue, that kind of thing in terms of the comedy and where it comes from. And it feels sophisticated in a weird way, even though it is also over the top, you know? Oh, oh absolutely. It's um sort of the Noel Coward. Yes, yes. Uh, the, the sort of Noel Coward comedy of 1930s horror cinema. It's uh, remarkable. I love that. Remarkable script. Yeah, I completely agree. Uh, well, well, uh, let's talk about... Actually, I just want to quickly ask you about the house itself as well, you know, because obviously such an important oh, part house. in everything yeah, we're going to yeah. discuss this series. The old dark house itself. What do you think of it and the way that James uh, Whale kind of brings this house to, to life on screen... I, I mean, I love I love it's kind of the shadows, yeah, the, cur- yeah. the billowing curtains, the hidden rooms, the staircases. Mm. You know, what what do you think of just the, the, the house itself and the way it's presented in this film? I, I applaud this film for making the house so authentically grotty. Yes. It's <laughs> not a place you'd want to spend any amount of time. And I think this is all the more remarkable because the art director on this film was Charles D. Hall, who had created in Universal's Dracula and Frankenstein ruined spaces which were also very gothically glamorous. So Dracula's castle in the Bela Lugosi version, it is a wreck, but it's a strangely attractive wreck. And the same is true in Frankenstein of the um, old abandoned watchtower where Frankenstein builds his lab. They're both appealing spaces. Um, So Mm. the irony by the time we get to the old dark house and we're in an actual home, is it's by far the least habitable of all of these spaces. <laughs> um, yes. It's it's brilliantly filmed as well. This 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 film is a riot of different textures, and um, yeah. I suppose maybe in that sense, um, it's taking its cue from the lashing storm outside. All of those rains, and mm. I mean, I, I I can think of very few films that I can watch in the comfort of my own home and. 
it feels so saturated with damp. <laughs> yes, it's so cold uh, you, and you, damp, isn't it? Oh, yeah. it's really, really foul. A real, <laughs> yeah, real, real downpour. And yeah, you, you, you do feel tainted with that dampness and then you get into the house and it's no better really um mm-hmm. J- jb Priestley is a wonderful um bit in the book where he says the house smelled of mice and old newspapers and although you can't smell a film this 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 film yeah it's suggestive yes. definitely of yes mice and old newspapers and yeah, think, think, things like the grottiness of the meal as well, those pickled onions and the potatoes with the enormous <laughs> eyes that have to be plucked out. And the fact it then ends up covering the floor, yes. accompanied by all these smashed dinner plates after Morgan said his rampage. Um, mm-hmm. I, I suppose as well you can talk about the storm itself being another kind of home invader. There's the scene where... Margaret opens Rebecca Femme's bedroom window and uh, converts that part of the house into a sort of floodplain in direct result. Yes, yes. And, um, and of course, Horace has this terror that the house is going to be flooded, even though it's built on rock <laughs> throughout. Um, yeah. Yeah, and there's, there's, there's also this pleasing verticality to um, the way the old dark house is played within the film, isn't it? Yes. Um, because... The obvious thing to do would be to have a cellar, which is a sort of tainted, dark, ominous space. And indeed, the next film we're going to discuss, The Raven, goes down exactly that more obvious route. Um, The Old Dark House has this wonderful kind of verticality to Mm. it, in that you're going up. You're you're going up the stairs. You're exploring more rooms. You're encountering people you didn't even realise were there. Yes. And you're 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 kind of coming into all these revelations about family secrets. Yes, I I love that about it too. This idea, and this is something we'll keep continuing. This is something that filmmakers like Hitchcock and later David Lynch become obsessed with. This idea of a house holding secrets, right behind closed doors, and yes, we yes. have no idea what's going on in this house when we first arrive in it, and how many inhabitants there actually are in these various different. Mm. Bed- bedrooms as oh, we yes, venture yes. upwards like you said up these scary uh, staircases that lead to these ominous spaces and cl- behind closed doors and that kind of thing and that's just all of that stuff is it works so well in this and i think james whale does such a great job of building that kind of mystery as to what mm. is up this next flight of stairs or what's behind this particular yes, door yes. you know i wondered whether you'd excuse me from coming with you i'm not very strong there are rather a lot of stairs I really should have told you before, but the the vanity of age, you know. So, let's talk about this incredible cast of characters. I mean, where do we even start? Should we start by talking about the Femme family? (laughs) Uh, Because Horace Femme and Rebecca Femme, for me, are two of my absolute favourite characters in in this film and in in any film from this era, really. I I love them so much. But what about you, James? What do you think? What do you make of these these strange characters? Yeah, I mean, I mean, where do you begin? (laughs) (laughs) Um, The the problem, I I said earlier, I'd quite like to see a stage version of this. Mm. But I only really want to see a stage version with this exact cast. Yes. This film is cast to the hilt in a way that is utterly unprecedented in my experience of film. I, I, I can think of very few films that um, are flawlessly cast in this way. It's a flawless ensemble. Yeah. Um, and it's peppered with so many rising stars who Universal and James Whale caught at a very early point in their careers. I... I stumbled only last week on a reissue poster from the late 1930s for The Old Dark House. And that's a really fascinating relic in that it changes the billing around to reflect who had since risen to greater prominence in Hollywood. Right. So so on that poster, the three people who are above the title are Raymond Massey, Melvin Douglas and Charles Lawton, all of whom have become major, major stars. I mean, Boris Karloff is just beneath the title. Mm. Um, That certainly wasn't the way it was advertised at the time. Um, And, you know, you even have people like Gloria Stewart who never really achieved stardom when she was at this age. And then in 1997, she appears in Titanic as the older version of Kate Winslet's character and gets an Oscar nomination. <laughs> yes, yes. You know, no no one in this film could do any wrong, it seems. Yeah. <laughs> They're all vindicated, you know, after 60-plus years, if not, um, you know, in, in their prime. Mm. Um, oh, God, I mean, yeah, this, this cast is just an embarrassment of riches. I could 
spend hours talking about each and every one of them. Um, I think for me, my personal favourites in the whole cast are Ernest Fessinger. Agreed. Who, who you've mentioned as uh, Horace Femme. But, but also for me, Charles Lawton as yes. Sir William Porterhouse. I mean, I mean I'm, an, I'm an enormous devotee of Charles Lawton anyway, but um, I, think, I think these two in particular stick out for me because two very different extend- extensions on um, the queer sensibility that this film has. You know, knowing that both Ernest Fester and Charles Lawton were gay, and James Whale himself was gay, mm. um, supervising their performances, it, it, it gives a really interesting nuance to everything. Because Ernest Fester and Charles Lawton were, I, th- I, think, I think, the only point at which they really had contact, in, in, insofar as any kind of similarity goes, is that they were both in lavender marriages. But Ernest Fester was a flamboyantly gay man, mm. whereas Charles Norton was very furtive and treated it as a sort of shameful secret, and it took him a very, very long time to come to terms with it. And, uh, of course, he never went public with it in his lifetime. But um, where Fessinger is concerned, he's so visually and so vocally astonishing. Um, oh, wonderful. <laughs> wonderful, isn't he? Yeah. Um, he's a human skeleton. There's a, there's a, there's a, there's a line that... Uh, Simon Callow has in his book on Norton where he uh, refers to Ernest Fester as having the air of a scandalised vampire. And that's yes. a particularly sort of wonderful um, encapsulation of what this performance is. Um, and I kind of like Horace Femme as a character. Yes. He, he, he is charismatic and as as compared to all of the other femmes, he's he's almost a bit of a sweetheart, isn't he? Um, <laughs> he is. he's, he's He's the only one who sort of makes a token effort to welcome anyone into the house and you know he he does sit around the fire with the uh more quote-unquote normal characters all night and um, yeah yeah <laughs> and yet at the same time there there are flashes of such bizarre behavior from him i was I, I was quite shocked returning to the film today because it's it's a line i was very struck by reading benighted but i had never noticed it in the film but it's in there where um he he comes out of his room very very briefly to say Saul has escaped and then he just informs the person he's speaking to kill him and he goes back in and locks himself away but it's so thrown away that I'd, I'd never previously noticed that oh Horace Femme says please murder my brother you, you'd do me a great favour um, yes <laughs> poor, well poor Horace he does seem a bit like, like you said he seems uh, the, he seems the most yeah. harmless of, of the Femme family right I think and uh, yes he, living he in probably. Fear. He's probably he probably is delighted to have a few people come over and save him from his own monstrous family. By yes, yeah, yeah. And really, I, 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 yeah, and, and I personally would be delighted to have someone like Charles Lawton in my house because uh, yes, <laughs> L- L- Lawton does a marvelous thing here, which I think is kind of emblematic of Wales' whole approach. He shows that a so-called ordinary character doesn't need to be played in a boring or conventional manner. Yes. Yes. I thought you were never going to open that door. Bye. <laughs> there must have been a reservoir bust or something. <laughs> Anyhow, before we knew where we were, something had fallen down and smashed the car in. <laughs> it's a wonder it didn't smash us. <laughs> I, I really love the fact as well that this film was made in America in the 1930s. At a point where to sell... A British made film in America, you had to inform people in America no one speaks with any trace of an accent. <laughs> yes. um, and then you have Charles Lawton, a Scarborough native who had come up through the London theatre, doing this absurd, preposterous, incredibly thick La- um, Lancashire accent. Yes, yes. I mean, I mean, I mean, Americans watching this in 1932 must have been knocked sideways what what is this voice what is going on here what what reality have I, have we entered into i mean the femmes are strange but who is this this sir william porterhouse character yeah he and he's he's obviously he sort of bursts in charles lawton kind of you know later on in the drama and it's it, yeah, it reminds yeah, yeah. me of like that kind of that sort of sitcom trope where you get like the big star mm. walks in and almost get a round of applause when they walk in through the door. Like it almost feels like that kind of a moment when Charles Lawson can suddenly appears, doesn't he? You know, it's wonderful. Well, this this was his first Hollywood film. Yeah. Knowing knowing what would follow, this is a big introduction, retrospectively, for yeah. a very big film personality and you know, a man who would make inestimable contributions to horror cinema. Acting-wise, when you look at his performance as Quasimodo in The Hunchback of Notre Dame, it's 
arguably, in my opinion, the greatest film performance of all time. And then he made what is arguably the greatest film of all time, The Night of the Hunter. Yeah, yeah. So um, yeah. It's, it's, it's lovely to think he came to Hollywood in a James Whale horror film like this, which is so accomplished. And, and Whale knew him from his London theatre days, so he was ah. determined to get him in the film. He knew Lawton was in Hollywood anyway, making Devil and the Deep, which I think got held up so Lawton was free to do The Old Dark House. Mm -hmm. And the same is true of Ernest Fessager. You know, J James Whale knew of Fessager from his London theatre days. Fessager had gone to New York to do a play on Broadway. Whale was aware of this and, you know, made sure he grabbed him for this film. Because you could so easily have undercast this film with uh, sort of more stock types. People who looked for part but couldn't quite deliver acting-wise. Yes, and, uh, yes. James Whale was clearly not going to have any of that. This, <laughs> this film is cast to the rafters. It's a joy for the actor's contribution. Well, I've got to just mention it even more as Rebecca Femme, because I... Yes, yes, you must. <laughs> I, you must. She is my absolute favourite, and the, the scene when she basically, yeah, just sort of attacks Margaret in that bedroom is absolutely... what I'm just like, mm. I just remember thinking, what is going yeah. on in this film? What is she doing? You know, all of that, that's yeah, fine, yeah, little yeah. rots, that's finer still. <laughs> You're wicked too. Young and handsome, silly and wicked. You think of nothing but your long, straight legs and your white body and how to please your man. You revel in the joys of fleshly love, don't you? That's fine stuff, but it'll rot. That's finer stuff still, but it'll rot too in time. Don't! How dare you! I love the whole thing. I think it's brilliant. It's so yeah. absurd and weird. And mm. you're just right there with Margaret going, yeah. what is happening in this moment? Yes, you know? yes. She's brilliant. I, th I, think for me, I think for me as well, the most wonderful thing about that particular scene is right at the end, after she's upbraided Margaret for being this <laughs> lustful red and white woman yes. who only thinks of her legs and her neck and how to please her man. <laughs> and, you know, has thumped her just above the bosom yes. to prove her point. And then in leaving the room, she... she Rebecca Femme looks at her own reflection in her sort of distorting funhouse mirror, yes. sort of peers at herself with this slight vanity, smooths down her hair, and then leaves. Yes. <laughs> yes. It's this lovely touch of ambiguity after she's just upbraided someone else for being vain. <laughs> Uh, it's marvelous. It's so brilliant. But yeah, the, even the way, the weird way in which that scene is filmed, like, like you say, the mirror, the kind of distortions mm. of Rebecca Femme's face, you know, uh, just James Whale just seems to be having the best time with this sequence. You know? Yes, yeah. And then and then also, of course, in that scene where, where you're getting all of those fractured views of Rebecca and yes. this repetition of the monologue, we assume in Margaret's fevered yes. imagination, you have those near subliminal shots of Morgan dropped in. Oh, yeah. Now, that's very scary. Yeah. It, and again, it makes me think of Norman Bates peering through the walls of his hotel. Mm -hmm. um, is, is, is Morgan watching Margaret even at that point? Yeah. It's great, isn't it? It's very know. again feels very yeah. ahead of its time. Those little weird techniques there that James Whale um, um, applies. It's so great. And let's yeah. talk about devils in the details. Uh, devils in the details. And let's quickly talk about Morgan as well. Then, so we've got the great Boris Karloff here. Um, what do you, yes. uh, you know? Obviously, you know, had worked with Whale, done Frankenstein's Creature the year before, had played Frankenstein's Creature yes, the year before. Yes. Um, what do you think of Boris Karloff in this particular well, film? I have to say, first of all, in common with everyone in this cast. I don't think anybody could have played this particular part better. <laughs> yes. I mean, this is peak Karloff. This is prime Karloff doing the Karloff skulk, doing the Karloff menace. Um, he's, he's priceless in this role. Um, that said, it's not a particularly rewarding part for him to display his full range of gifts as an actor. No. We're not entirely sure why Universal gave him such a feeble follow-up to his role in Frankenstein. Um, they did do him a better service shortly after this when they cast him in The Mummy, which came out later in 1932. Um, yeah, I mean, Boris Karloff had a strangely adversarial relationship with James Whale. That could possibly be the key to it. It's, it's a very complex thing, and neither man really ever made a public statement on quite what the difficulty was but I think essentially the problem was that James Whale had insisted on casting Boris Karloff as the monster in Frankenstein there are numerous stories about how he came upon Boris Karloff um, some say he watched Karloff in the criminal code some say he just 
bumped into Karloff in the Universal Commissary one day. But um, James Whale, in a very Frankenstein way, kind of felt he'd created Boris Karloff. And I think this became a kind of envy when Frankenstein was released, and Boris Karloff, despite being billed with a question mark in the opening credits, started to get rather more attention than James Whale had been getting up to that point. Because you have to remember, James Whale was Universal star director. Um, so I think that was an element. Um, I think there was probably a slightly prickly class dynamic going on here. Because James Whale has been reported as saying very dismissively of Boris Karloff in later years, oh, he was just a truck driver when I cast him in Frankenstein. Which was true insofar as Boris Karloff was doing all sorts of bits of manual labour just to make a living and have a crust to survive on in Hollywood, pre-stardom. But Boris Karloff had come from a very wealthy, sort of slightly aristocratic English family and had been publicly schooled and... Um, it, it was very much Karloff's imperative that he left all that behind him and went first to Canada and then to Hollywood in order to try and carve out a career as an actor. So Boris Karloff was sort of a gentleman, but a gentleman of a very unconventional kind. And this was true of Whale as well. James Whale had done the reverse in a way, you could say, because James Whale had come from a very impoverished background growing up in the black country, and had kind of turned himself into this man of high culture, having come from a family and a life where he was, you know, a bit of a fish out of water, and people weren't necessarily attuned to the finer things and theatre and art. So I'm sure that was an element, James Wells' basic insecurity about him being this self-made gentleman, whereas Boris Karloff was the definite article. And um, it's also true that James Wells treated Boris Karloff quite appallingly at times during the making of Frankenstein. Um, Boris Karloff worked a 25-hour day on Frankenstein at one point, and... One element of that was James Whale forcing Boris Karloff to carry Colin Clive, playing Frankenstein, up the hill towards the windmill for the climax of the film, over and over and over and over again. And that was the start of Boris Karloff's lifelong back problems, and these were serious back problems. Karloff had to have three different back surgeries, and... Um, you know, we, we're talking about this kind of thing happening in the 1940s. Back surgery was not um, nearly as sophisticated as it is now. So, um, yeah, there were tensions, to say the least, between those two gentlemen. And Karloff also had tensions with Universal. Um, there's a general sense that Universal took Boris Karloff for granted. Um, there were contract disputes where they didn't offer Boris Karloff his due, so Boris Karloff walked off the lot and they had to go into crisis talks to uh, negotiate him a higher fee. And C Certainly around this time, Boris Karloff was very much in the frame to be cast in the lead for The Invisible Man, and we're not quite sure why that didn't happen. Possibly it was Boris Karloff being discontented with Universal and therefore not being considered as available as they wanted him to be, but then again, James Whale possibly didn't want to cast Boris Karloff as the Invisible Man. He had his heart set on Claude Rains. Mm. And, yeah, there's that recurring sense that Whale would treat Karloff on set with a kind of baseline respect, but um, the people he really wanted to hang around with were, you know, his old London theatre mates like Ernest Fessinger. Yeah. I don't think Karloff and Whale had much in common. Mm-hmm. Mm Oh, that's interesting, isn't it? Because, yeah, you think of these two as this kind of perfect collaboration in a lot of ways. So that's kind of really interesting to hear, yeah. Uh, maker and monster, Mike. Yes, exactly, exactly. <laughs> um, well, let, we should we need to move on soon to the next film, but I want There's a couple more things I want to talk about. Um, oh yeah. You mentioned class already there when you were talking a bit about Karloff and, and and Whale, and I wondered, you know, do you see class coming into this film in any way, shape, or form as well? Because I think it's something that we're going to talk about a lot going forward. It's quite a big component of home yes. invasion um, as we move forward in time. Do you see any kind of social comment? 
country or class or anything like that um, in this movie. Well, I, I suppose this is yet another blurred or broken boundary, isn't it? All of these classes and all of these people of various different backgrounds mixed up together before the uh, femme fireplace in the centre of the femme household. Um, yeah, there, is, there, there are definitely class-conscious elements of elements present in this, aren't there? Um, I, I can't ever forget that J.B. Priestley wrote another very important home invasion story, um, which is trotted out constantly in UK schools, which is An Inspector Calls. Um, yeah. A story about a home invasion by an inspector, which has... Um, you know, a very important supernatural twist. And Inspector Calls, of course, deals with the tragedy of Eva Smith and the attempt to figure out precisely who is responsible for her death. And Eva Smith is a woman from a lower-class background, and I think we find a version of this in miniature with um, Sir William Porterhouse telling the tale of his dead wife, who um, certainly in his mind died because she was socially rejected. She, she, She... sort of gave up on life because she felt that in being mocked at a party for wearing this cotton frock that she was holding Sir William back in some way. And I, I, I think we are definitely led to believe that Sir William has bought that title. Uh, <laughs> he, is, he, is not we'd, he is not what we'd normally understand by a knight of the realm with that uh, incredibly thick Lancashire accent of his. Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, there's a general sense in this, I think, Mike, of there being... A kind of hope residing with the the younger people, the younger characters, and the sort of old guard being, in a sense, past reclamation. Yes, I mean, yeah. All all of the younger characters in this are rather sweet, despite any amount of class differences. Um, you know, I think Sir William is incredibly sweet and an absolute model of dignity. When you know he he is essentially told he's lost Gladys as. The love interest in his life, uh-huh. you know. I think yeah. I think I think his words are, "I think you're a lunatic," but I'm not angry. And then he yes. just throws himself <laughs> yes. into, you know, picking the table yeah. off the uh, floor and you know being <laughs> Mister Practicality. But um, yeah, and, and Gladys is a rather wonderful character. Um, she is, and the words "chorus girl" were of course highly charged at that time. Um, mm. In in the novel, actually, she even says. I really was in the chorus, you know, at one point. And, you know, she's right. essentially saying, I, I'm, I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not a sex worker. Yeah, <laughs> but, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, there, there is that um, baggage attached, unfortunately. And, um, yeah, the older characters, you know, all of the femme family, they're, they're, they're just Dickensian grotesques, aren't they? I mean, yes. <laughs> the, the thing about Dickensian grotesques is they're rarely, if ever, capable of any kind of change. Yeah. I don't, I don't think Horace is ever going to change from his constant state of watchful terror i don't think rebecca's ever going to change from being um just this hateful little shriveled up fundamentalist um, <laughs> yes yeah yes they're all so, just sort so of I, trapped in time a bit aren't they yeah so yeah. so i i think the youthfulness of the um of the invaders of the house regardless of any amount of class differences i think that's seen as sort of a source of hope yes Yes, and it's always fun to see them all come together. I mean, everyone loves that dinner scene, don't they? Everyone loves oh, to have a, have a potato. Heavenly. It's just so wonderful, isn't it? It's so, you know, again, it's like, you're right, you know, I think it would make in some ways such a good, great play, although this movie is, again, so cinematic, as we've already discussed, but just watching these people around oh, the dinner table is so oh, much fun. Oh, it's wonderful. It's wonderful. Yeah. And, yeah, I, I mean, I have to tell you, Mike, one of the great joys in reading the novel at last, Benighted, was, first of all, in discovering how faithful the script of the old Dark House is to the source material. I would estimate 90% or upwards of the lines in the old Dark House are directly from the novel, you know, insofar as novel-to-screen adaptations of horror go. It's almost in the bracket of Rosemary's Baby with regards to faithfulness. But um, one of the most wonderful things about that, Mike, was discovering which lines are original to <laughs> yes. this film and are therefore indicative of James Whale's approach. Yeah. And James Whale's take on this particular subject matter. I'll just cycle through a few of my favourite original to the old Dark House lines and moments. Please. Because they all rank among some of the most priceless. 
So one of the early ones is, um, and Gloria Stewart recounted James Whale and Ernest Fessinger discussing this and inventing it on the set, which makes it very exciting. One of my favourite early moments is when they've just entered the house and they're walking towards the fireplace and Horace picks up some flowers from the chairs and says to his guests, my sister was on the point of arranging these flowers and then nimbly throws them all in the yes. fire. It's wonderful, a wonderful I, start. I love we know that e- moment. Yeah. yeah. We, we, we know exactly what sort of film we're dealing with from that moment on. Um, <laughs> yes. There is a dinner scene and a bravura dinner scene in the novel, but it doesn't have the catchphrase, have a potato. <laughs> oh, what? Oh, um, yeah, so that's, a, that's another glory of glories in this particular Brilliant. film adaptation. Um, oh, there's another line I really, really love, which is the old man, the old patriarch who's played by an old woman yes, um, lying yes. in the bed upstairs. It's, it's a testament to how full of riches this film is that we haven't even had a chance to discuss that there's an old man being played by an old woman. You know, it's, <laughs> <laughs> That's just yes. by the by in the universe of the old outhouse. But again, one of my favourite lines is... Um, original to this film which is um this old man suddenly dawning to this self-awareness saying you see when you're as old as i am at any minute you may just die <laughs> <laughs> wonderful wonderful um so oh, oh gosh another, another moment which isn't in benighted which is in the old dark house is possibly the funniest exchange in the film which is just after philip waverton defending margaret has engaged in an unbelievably violent fight with Morgan, which has culminated in Morgan falling head over heels down a flight of stairs. They've just checked to see whether he's dead or not. Yeah. And then Margaret says, Oh, Philip, this is an awful house. And Philip's response is, It isn't very nice, is it? <laughs> it's wonderfully English and wonderfully understated, and I don't really do it justice in my, uh, in my reading there, but... Um, you're right, oh, it's, it's so perfect. English. It's perfect. Screamingly it? funny, screamingly Just funny. perfect. Is he dead? No, you can see him breathing from here. He's only stunned. He'll be conscious in a minute, though he'll probably fall asleep again. He's very drunk. Oh, Philip, this is an awful house. It isn't very nice, is it? Oh, it's brilliant, isn't it? It's so brilliant. Well, we've, we're going to have to finish on this, but I'm, I want to. F- but we haven't even really mentioned Saul. But let's mention, you know, that final act and that kind of reveal of Saul uh, and that sort of final mm. showdown moment. What, what do you think of the way this film kind of climaxes? I suppose. Oh, it's fantastically good, isn't it? It's worth saying it's a great improvement on the novel. Because in the novel, Saul is much more like Morgan. He's a he's a mute brute. So when he ah. breaks out, it's um. You know, it's very much by the by. It's um, but it's um, it's it's changed here into really great theatre, and it's another example of James Well importing an actor to his project just because he was determined to have that particular actor there. And in this case, it's Brember Wills, a Saul, who who never made any other Hollywood films, was brought over from the London theatre just to play this relatively small part. Yes, he's so wonderful in the part that that's his immortality. <laughs> Um, it, it, it probably didn't seem at all significant to him at the time, given he was playing at the Old Vic and doing his Shylock on the London stage. But, you know, this this is his little piece of immortality, and I think that's really, really wonderful. Um, yeah, I, I suppose as well, turning Saul into a highly articulate madman, it's another example of this film being more interested in uh, verbal sparring than yes. violent physicality and, well, slapstick, but very, very scary slapstick. And... Well, we, we, we do get that, you know, Saul does finally flip and it's quite a thing to see this diminutive little man smashing someone over the head with a chair and tearing around the room, setting fire to the tapestry and then actually biting Pendrel on the neck. It's a touch of Dracula <laughs> yes. which yes. goes on. And um, yeah, you've got all the beautiful, highly visual language packed with religious illusions, um, you know, talking about the soul of the bible and yeah yeah he's yeah. that particularly wonderful description of the fire being cold and being knife-like and that's also wonderful in that you're setting up the fire as an elemental threat in the same way the storm outside the waters of the storm have been an elemental threat up to this point and now you've got a contrasting one in the coming fire this uh, this inferno but um pendrel dies in this fight in the novel and it ends on a rather tragic note 
I'm so glad if I didn't go down that route with this. Mm. Um, because it, it allows the film to remain a comedy rather than a tragedy. Yes. Except, except of course, where Paul Morgan is concerned, because you, you do, of course, see that he had some kind of strange, twisted, off-centre love for Saul. Mm. It's, um, mm-hmm. yeah, very, yeah, very poignant. Very unexpectedly yeah, poor old, poignant. Poor old Morgan. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Because poor for everyone else, for everyone else, it does end. You know, it's it's a very classic kind of right. Well, now the sun is up. It's morning, and everything's going to be okay, happily ever yeah. after. Kind of an ending, isn't yeah. it? Really? Yeah. 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 Absolutely. I love yeah. the. I love how these films never waste any time. They get in and out. You know, c- cut to oh, credits God. straight away as soon as the <laughs> as soon as the action's finished. You know, it's great. Well, the, ne- the next film we're going to discuss is a particularly good example of that. Oh, wonderful, wonderful. Mm. Yeah. Uh, so there you go. To finish on the old dark house, James. I mean, like it feels it's it feels so important. Even the title, the mm. old dark house, feels so important to the horror genre. Do you know what I mean? But but yes. you know, like how how do you think? How do you think this movie? Where do you think this movie sits now in the kind of history of the genre, and and how do you think it holds up? Well, I I, I obviously think it holds up absolutely beautifully. I I, I think mm. if anything, it's become better with time. You know, we, we've come to more fully appreciate quite how sophisticated and quite how smart the comedy in it is. Yeah, I I do wonder whether the old dark house has kind of had a tenuous influence on other horrors, where you have lots of very strange people gathered under one roof as this kind of dysfunctional slash slash barely functioning family unit. I mean, I I don't for a moment think, for example, that the Texas Chainsaw Massacre was consciously modelling itself on the old Dark House, but there is a sort of vague connection you could point to, and certainly another very awkward dinner sequence. Yes, Um, yes, yes. I I, I was thinking of things like um, the Adams Family or the Munsters, too. You know, these kind of, like, quirky outsiders, you know, Mm. the kind of, you know, these kind of spooky households full of people or spooky families, you know. Yeah, Yeah. I, I I think the kind of basic aimlessness of the Munsters or particularly the Adams family is much closer to the old dark house because yeah. um, I suppose that's the thing with the Texas Chainsaw Massacre you know that family is a plan and a plot and yes, yes. that's what they're working towards um, in the old dark house it's really just about stopping Saul from doing anything so it's just inactivity to the end I suppose you yeah. could say yeah. They, yeah. They, they just capture their in time in the prison in the Welsh moors and you know they they want nothing better than for absolutely nothing to happen so yeah i think i think there's probably probably yeah. more of a connection to the adams family they're just trying to live their lives in their own small yet very very macabre way i uh, yeah and i think you know you mentioned psycho earlier as well and psycho kind of always feels like a film of two halves anyway but you know the stuff that takes place you know for most of this film feels so current and so modern but when we're in the bates house it does feel like a bit of an old dark house particularly how you've got this old Mm, matriarch hidden upstairs you know uh, on the top floor and then obviously moves down to the cellar but yeah there is something of an old dark house there too i think isn't there in the bates house? i mean mean, psycho is yeah, I, I suppose in in the bounds of one film, it is that interchange between the old American Gothic, which you could say is typified by the likes of the old Dark House, and what was to come, the new strain of American Gothic. There you go. Amazing. Well, there's so much more we could probably say about that film, James, but we're going to have to move on. That is James Whale's incredible The Old Dark House from 1932. Before we move on to the second half of this week's episode, just going to take a moment to thank this week's sponsor. That's $20 Patreon subscriber Dominic Mezzanotte. Uh, Dominic says, Hi Mike, I'm a big fan of the pod from over here in the US. I hadn't dabbled in horror much until the beginning of 2020, and that ended up being weirdly good timing with quarantine. So I started watching about four movies a day in general, lots of horror in there, and I've been using the pod as a guide for a lot of that. I do have something to plug. I have a free substack where I cover movies, TV, video games, and comics and books depending on the week. The idea is thoughtfully assessing and analysing without skewing negative, but without being mindlessly effusive either. I thought there might be some crossover in your fan base since one of the things that drew me to the pod in the first place was your and other hosts' predilection for saying they love something even if that's not the popular opinion, but also deferring to others' takes and thoughts as well. Anyway, the site is thegoodtake.substack.com 
www.thepodcastmedia.com. Thanks again for the enjoyable and informative work you do. Oh, thank you so much uh, to this week's sponsor, Dominic Mezzanotte, uh, and I will read that link for you one more time if you want to check it out. That's thegoodtake.substack.com. Um, where you can check out all of Dominic's reviews on movies, video games, TV shows and comic books. And if you'd like to become an official Evolution of Horror sponsor just like Dominic and get your own little dedicated segment on an episode just like this one, then you simply need to sign up to our Patreon at a $20 level. Head on over to patreon.com slash evolution of horror. Signing up at the highest tier of $20 per month will get you access to every single bonus episode in the back catalogue you'll carry on receiving weekly bonus episodes from that point onwards and you get to write me a little message that I will read out on the main podcast just like this one where you can plug your own blog or website or music or short film or anything you like uh, for other listeners to check out patreon.com slash evolution of horror Okay, let's return to the second half of this week's episode as James Swanton and I delve deep into the bonkers 1935 film starring Bela Lugosi and Boris Karloff, The Raven. It's hard to talk. That's to be expected. It will disappear. Do I look different? Yes. Something's the matter. My eye. That will pass. One. My mouth. I want to see myself. All right. Just wait here. There is one thing you must know about the Raven. This is Bela Lugosi's world, and you're just lucky to be living in it. <laughs> so, Lugosi here plays Dr. Richard Volin, a man of high, high culture. He is a genius neurosurgeon, he plays the organ well, he attends the ballet. He's a very snazzy line in neckties, actually. Unfortunately, he's also an Edgar Allan Poe devotee, even super fan who has recreated the author's torture devices in his cellar. So when he falls rather unhappily in love, things do not end well. Mm, indeed. What a bonkers film this is. Now, you're you're the one that recommended this film to me, James. We were, we were cu- trying to come up with something that might work well as a pairing with The Old Dark House, yeah, something maybe yeah. from this era. <laughs> um, I had so much fun with this film, but what... what oh, I'm so glad. I loved it. I thought it was br- hilarious. Yeah. Uh, tell me your thoughts on this film, and what was it that sort of struck you as an interesting film to, to discuss? Well, I, uh, I suppose it's the same basic type of home invasion that you find in The Old Dark House. It's yeah. the um, apparently normal case characters i think where this film is concerned normal has to be in the biggest inverted commas in the universe the apparently <laughs> normal characters get trapped in the home of the mad or bad character yes um yeah there are lots of incidental touches that i think connect this one with the old dark house i mean it's another universal horror film of course um both of them start with cars in peril on the road this one in a very very lightning quick fashion oh it's <laughs> both so of good them feature Oh, it's oh, it's amazing. No messing around. Um, both both films feature a storm outside the house, which serves as a kind of secondary threat, a secondary home mm. invasion. And both of these films have Boris Karloff as a manservant. Yes, with other yes. with other actors stealing the film from around him. Well, sorry, I should say one other actor stealing the film from him, and that's Bela Lugosi. And yeah, I I think this film is contagiously. Well, really, because hysterically fun in yes the manner of the old dark house. Although it has to be said, where the old dark house, I believe, knows what it's doing, it knows its <laughs> comedy as much as horror. I never really believe that the makers of the Raven were aware they were making a comedy. 
I am. I, I. I think Boris Karloff probably got it. I think some of the actors got it. I don't know if Lugosi got it for a second. Really? Um, mm, that's interesting. Oh, it's a funny one. <laughs> the question of tone, where this film is concerned, it's an out of control horror comedy. Yes. But I find that rather thrilling. Yes, I have to say. I agree. I agree. It's... It, it, the, the, the kind of the levels of absurdity feel like they sort of slowly crank mm. up, mm. right? Don't they? And oh, absolutely. It's 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 a complete exercise in extremity. This yes, film. and yes, you know, it, it has to be said from a historical perspective. This, this this film has often been held up as one of the reasons that Hollywood basically ceased producing horror films for a few years. <laughs> I mean, I mean that can be overstated, but um, it came at a point where a lot of authority figures were at the end of their tether with dealing with all this prurient horror product anyway. Mm. And The Raven in particular met a big backlash from the right-wing press in the UK. Badge of honour. And and, yeah. and also the US production code, who really were meddling a lot mm. during this film's... this, you know, this, this film's production. And, um... Yeah, wanted nothing more than to kill Horror Dead. And, right. And, I mean, of course, this is also an exercise in extremity when it comes to Bela Lugosi. I mean, he, he's... <laughs> no no other actor could or would deliver this particular performance. He's, he's essentially a live-action Disney villain. But, um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> you know, di- Disney villains are one of the reasons I'm an actor, and I think Bela Lugosi is, so that's that's all right by me. Yes, he... What a, what a <laughs> performance from Bela Lugosi, and it's always it's oh, always fun that when we have Bela and Boris together, right? We've discussed the Black Cat together oh, yes, already yes. at this point in time, yes, haven't yeah. we? Um, how do you find the two of them together on screen and the way they play off each other in this film? Oh, there's a lot to say here. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I think I think at its simplest, this is a really fascinating insight into the star personas of both actors. Certainly where the Black Cat is concerned, I think we did talk about it being conceivable that they could have swapped parts in that yes, form. And it would have yes. been maybe not as good, but still very, very interesting. They they could each have played the other's parts very, very well. I think a role swap where the Raven is concerned would have been completely inconceivable. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, so interesting to compare and contrast how both are played on the screen. So Boris Karloff, true to form as Universal's new Lon Chaney, he gets two very transformative makeups. Mm. He has his bearded gangster look and then he has his... Um, I don't really know how to describe his uh, deformity. No, but, uh, no, that's a very um, that's a very um, unusual. <laughs> the eye makes uh, me laugh. Makeup from Jack Pierce. Yes. <laughs> yeah, um, it's possibly symptomatic of the production code getting involved because they had to sign off on Karloff's makeup on this film. So we're left with this bizarre, pulpy monstrosity that looks kind of part Halloween mask. It's <laughs> yes. um it, it's I, I think it's certainly Jack Pierce's weakest ever makeup, but um I don't know if that's entirely Jack Pierce's fault. I, mm. I I get the impression his his hands were tied and he was forced to come up with something more obviously artificial than he perhaps would have done right. otherwise. Um so yes, Karloff gets to physically transform, whereas Legosi True to most Lugosi performances, very recognizably Baylor Lugosi. He he was not a fan of heavy makeups, which is one of the reasons he was initially glad not to be in Frankenstein, and you know, sadly, that was his downfall in a way because it created Boris Karloff as his uh, yeah. threat to getting a corner on the horror market. Um, yeah, and also, if if we compare and contrast, Boris Karloff gets to play a kind of sympathetic monster archetype. Um, it's kind of hard won or undeserved sympathy because we do hear that Karloff's character earlier in the story has. Um, shoved a burning torch into a bank cashier's face <laughs> yes. it's um, he shouldn't be sympathetic but you know he gets this um touching if slightly superficial exchange with Jean, who um is sympathetic to him when no one else is and that emboldens him to save her life at the end of the film yes um Lugosi, by contrast is deeply unsympathetic but he is charismatic in the way of the devil that, that was very true of a lot of Lugosi performances mm, um mm-hmm. They're both playing stock characters they had played or would play a lot yes. across their careers. So Boris Karloff, weirdly, had played a lot of gangsters. Um, he's in the original Scarface as a gangster, and um, I, don't, I don't think gangsters really 
were Karloff's most natural casting. He's a rather fantastical choice for a gangster. And, of course, he, he, he never attempts to do an American accent. He always sounds very like Boris Karloff. Yes, yes. So um, that's, that's an interesting peculiarity that just adds to the intoxicating absurdity of this film. And um, Lugosi is playing his great archetype of the mad doctor. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's probably obvious already from how I've been doing this compare and contrast that um, these two men are very differently invested in this particular enterprise. Mm. So Boris Karloff does commit to the material, and I think he doesn't disgrace himself in any way, shape or form, but he kind of goes at it with a certain distance. Mm. I think basically the thing was that he understood that this film was completely insane. And certainly from remarks he made in later years, he didn't seem to have enjoyed making it and he didn't seem to enjoy thinking about it yeah. ever afterwards um his makeup is very very weak and um mm. i i know from first hand experience there's nothing more upsetting than wearing a horror makeup that isn't quite working yeah that fortunately has not happened to me very often but when it does it, it really hampers what you're able to do expressively and it, it you you get very protective of yourself and and you feel very vulnerable because what is a deficiency in the makeup can make you look very deficient as an actor. Mm. And there's also a story that Ian Wolfe, who's one of the supporting cast in this, tells about when, when he first met Boris Karloff. Um, very early, one morning at Universal, Boris Karloff was clearly there to go into makeup. And, you know, he was approached by Ian Wolfe, who was just making light conversation. And Ian Wolfe said to Karloff, um, oh, by the way, could you, could you direct me to a toilet? And apparently Karloff looked round, gestured to the studio and said, this whole place is a toilet. <laughs> so um, he was not happy with Universal at the time, which is a bit churlish, I have to say, given he gets first billing in this film. Yes, yes. And surname only billing him at Karloff. Yeah. Lugosi gets it very briefly at the beginning, but then in the list with the other cast members, he's back to being being. Bela Lugosi mm. and second bill to Karloff and it's also worth saying he got double Lugosi's salary <gasps> oh poor Bela Lugosi, Lugosi earned five thousand dollars for this film Boris Karloff earned ten thousand dollars so a bit shitty of Karloff yeah. as much as I love Karloff to have been not particularly graceful about this assignment mm. now Lugosi as compared to Karloff treats Dr. Volin as the absolute bloody role of his life <laughs> um he is having a ball with this. He is. And he he does, by his sheer strength of commitment, deliver a real seam of darkness, which I think is at odds with how shallow this film is most of the time in engaging with these themes of torture and <laughs> yes. mutilation and all the rest of it. Um, yes. I think it's something we touched on in the Patreon episode we did on Vincent Price, but... Um, it's it's very, very applicable here in that, um, as with Vincent Price's Edward Lionheart in Theatre of Blood, mm. Bela Lugosi's Dr. Volin in The Raven, he's getting at the essence of melodramatic acting. Yes. And actually, there's an interview Lugosi gave um, around this time, which um, sets out that he was very, very deliberate in this approach. Bela Lugosi said, No matter how hokum or highly melodramatic the horror part may be, you must believe in it while you are playing it. Um, that's yeah. that's it. You know, proper melodrama is brilliant. Mm. And proper melodrama isn't parody. It isn't taking the piss. Yeah. It's treating the most ludicrous situations with life and death seriousness. And <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> no, one, no one has simultaneously treated something so seriously as Bela Lugosi does in the Raven, <laughs> whilst also being so deliriously fun with it. I, it's it's wonderful. I love it's a, it. It's an yeah. absolute joy. I, 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 and I don't think this film would work at all were it not for Bela Lugosi. I, I don't think any other actor could have done it. Completely agree. Completely agree. He steals it. I, I actually think I prefer this performance to Dracula. <laughs> His performance is Dracula. He's so much fun in this. I think he's having a great... Well, it's Bela Lugosi off the leash. Yes. Um, yeah. It's great. Possibly to his detriment. I mean, uh, uh, quite quite a few writers, such as Greg Mank, have speculated that he probably sort of destroyed his own image in the eyes of casting directors uh. through um, his, his 
no holds barred commitment to this you know boris karloff with his relative distance is clearly you know he's kind of winking at the audience saying this is all make-believe this is all silliness i'm gonna put a show on but you know i know it's a show and you know it's a show so let's just have fun with it lugosi seems to actually believe this stuff as with the old dark house and the humor there being so hysterical that it becomes kind of horrific in an unexpected way. I, I I think you can say much the same of Bela Lugosi in this role. The more you think about the sort of themes this film is dwelling on, no matter how shallowly, mm. and how Bela Lugosi engages with those themes, with no trace of discernible irony. Yes. <laughs> just just a lot of glee, devilish glee. It, it does become slightly disturbing, I think. I think so, yeah, I think so. Um, mm. what- and, and probably in 1935, it was very disturbing. <laughs> um, um. It's, and let's talk about its connection to Poe, because obviously the film is called The Raven, and this was the... Yes. the and you've already mentioned, you know, Murders in the Rue Morgue and, and The Black Cat, this kind of... The last almost in a sort of trio of Poe films, I suppose, in a way, right? Oh, yes, Universal yeah. had done. Um, but of course, it's not really an adaptation or anything, is it? As much as it is... <laughs> kind of it's just about a person who is obsessed with poe right and, and, and what what do you think of the way that it kind of references poe and connects to poe's work in that way yeah it's um it's opening a can of worms this subject isn't it <laughs> um i think it's worth observing from the off that um i think we're both fans of edgar Allan poe aren't we Mark? yes and we- absolutely you know, we, we, we may not have read every single one of his stories, but we do have a good working knowledge of Poe because we, we both love horror cinema. So we're both fans of Poe. My question is, is Dr. Volin actually a fan of Poe? <laughs> because he really only seems to know The Raven and The Pit and the Pendulum. Yes. <laughs> one poem, one story. He's, he's, he very much strikes me as the sort of man I'd go out of my way to annoy if I was ever at a party with him. You know, I'd, I'd be sidling up to him after a few glasses of Prosecco going, Dr. Volling, can we talk about Poe's The Gold Bug? Dr. Volling, can we talk about The Imp of the Perverse? Can we talk about The Premature Burial? Dr. Volling. Um, so so I, think, I think that is a mark of this film's relative shallowness yet again. And I have to say, I think, I think there is a more interesting version of this film which would unfold much more along the lines of Theatre of Blood, where yes. it was Dr. Volin killing off person after person with different Edgar Allan Poe torture devices. This film only delivers two, and they're both from the pit and the pendulum. Yeah, and yeah. With neither does Dr. Volin kill anyone. No one dies under that pendulum, and in the room where the walls come together, the only person to die in that is Dr. Volin. <laughs> so... <laughs> He's, um, oh God, bless Baylor. He tries, doesn't he? But um, nothing nothing really works out. Boris Karloff certainly harboured a particular distaste about this film being so tenuously connected to Poe, mm. um, mm-hmm. which I think is, a, again, a bit churlish of him because he had seemingly no problem about the Black Cat the previous year having bugger all to do with yes. Edgar Allan Poe's for Black Cat. So so in interviews later in life, um, Boris Karloff said, why, it was nothing but a bloody stuffed bird on Bela Lugosi's desk. <laughs> and you think, well, hang on, Boris. In 1963 with Roger Corman, you did another version of The Raven, which has as little to do with Poe's poem as this particular story. So, yeah, it's... Um, I do love that, though. I do it's love a rather that. strange Karloff's Karloff's hatred of this particular version of the Raven. Yes, seemed to be enduring. That's um, hilarious. But I do love it how this is basically uh, <laughs> uh, called the Raven because there is just a stuffed Raven, and that that's basically its connection yes, to the poem, yeah, yeah. isn't it? It's so that's funny. It. Otherwise, a, a man, it's, it's man, just the pit and the pendulum, really. You know, it is. Yeah. It is. I mean, I mean, it's kind of a shame in a way, isn't it? Because Edgar Allan Poe's poem, The Raven, is a kind of archetypal home invasion, isn't it? You know, yes, the black bird coming in through the window and then bedeviling the, um, you know, the uh, life such as it is of this old man in mourning for the lost Lenore. Yes, and, you know, of course, Edgar Allan Poe was also responsible for another archetypal home invasion horror in the form of the Mask of the Red Death. Mm. So there is that element to be mined from Poe, but I mean, I think this film, given the flimsiness of trying to adapt. A poem such as *The Raven* into a a full blown narrative. I think I think its answer in turning it into the story of an obsessive fan it's 
it's rather a canny solution, isn't it? Um, yeah. I don't. I don't know. I don't know if this film is quite the forerunner of something like Misery, but, uh, but yes, yes, <laughs> but yeah. There, there is some sort of horror to be taken from obsessive literary fans. And um, agreed, agreed. I I'm, think. I'm, I think I'm, there are a lot yeah. of interesting ideas here. Maybe not like you said, not quite as well executed as they could have been. But there is something really interesting mm. at the seed of that, isn't there? I mean, I you think? can almost yeah. argue that Volin seemingly being quite disengaged from. Edgar Allan Poe's full works feeds into this idea of the obsessive fan because certainly in my observation obsessive fans are often the most disconnected from the things they claim to be fans of yes yes. Um, I think this may you know be the get out clause for Volin's seemingly superficial grasp on things because really Poe is all about him as in Dr Volin engages with Edgar Allan Poe insofar as it allows him to be Dr. Volin in the way he wants to be Dr. Volin. Yes, exactly. He, he invents a bizarre story uh, later on in the film when he's asked the meaning of the raven, and he gives this completely cock and bull answer saying, Poe was a great genius, like all great geniuses. There was in him the will to do something great. And then, uh, you know, then, then he's talking about, um, you know, the poem is... Poe's response to falling in love. Her name was Lenore. It's like, this, this is absolutely nothing to do with anything we know about Edgar Allan Poe. You're, you're a fantasist. You're deluded. You're a perfect obsessive fan in that regard. But, um, yeah, I, I suppose this film may, in a backhanded, probably quite accidental way, get to another thing that's explored in Poe's poem, in that it does suggest, like the raven, the poem how an unrequited or hopeless love can be perverted into a kind of masochism. Yeah. Um, the man in his chair conversing with the raven is tormenting himself. He's not just being tormented. He's choosing, to some extent, this all-consuming grief for this lost loved one. Mm. Um, and this is a thing Dr. Volling kicks into overdrive. He is unable to accept that he cannot be with Jean. Yes. To the point where... His mad scheme, when he acts it out, isn't really even about him ensnaring Jean. Um, it's it's simply about killing everyone connected to her, especially her father, but also Jean herself. So he he is a complete monster of selfishness. He's incapable of love, and his relationship with Jean, rather like his relationship with Poe, it's all about him. It's all about Dr. Volin. Mm. Absolutely. There's, there's that moment, yeah, there's that moment early on after he saved Jean's life by performing the brain operation where um, they're together in his house and um, she's complimenting him on his musical abilities and says, you're almost not a man, you're... And she doesn't finish the sentence. Dr. Volin finishes it saying, a god. Yeah. <laughs> A god with the taint of human emotions. So, oh my god, get over yourself, man. But then again, you're Bela Lugosi in your prime. You're allowed to be. A it's fine, either. but I love I it. Yeah, Doctor Volin, the original toxic fan. Basically, this is brilliant. I love toxic fans, as you know, mate. Well, don't we all? Um, Absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, there you go. That's really interesting. And you know, we are going to be covering some Poe adaptations later on in this series. We're going to be doing movies like The House of Usher and Pit and the Pendulum because oh, they do the have these, you know, these excellent stuff. connections to, you know, the 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 the, the home and these houses. That that harbour secrets, secret rooms, and all kinds of other things like that, a lot of these Poe adaptations. And mm. and the house in this movie is wonderful, isn't it? Particularly in the final act. Oh, isn't oh it? Oh, my goodness. Let's, yes, let's talk yes. about the house itself. It's so much fun. I think it was you that said to me uh, over WhatsApp, James, that it's almost like we're in a sort of Looney Tunes <laughs> cartoon, right? A live-action Looney Tunes cartoon. Yes, absolutely. But it's just wonderful, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean it's, it's, it's worth saying, first of all, that this film takes a rather different approach to the old dark house in terms of setting out its central house. Mm. Um, Dr. Volin's domicile is, for the most part, a rather modern, clean, spruced-up yes. mansion. Yes. It's not a house that on the surface appears in any way inhospitable, but underneath you have a dungeon <laughs> which is enormous and looks extraordinarily medieval. It's it, it in no way fits with this being a film taking place in then modern America. So I suppose in Freudian terms you could say this is like descending into Volin's mind. You know, you're you're entering his world and you're living out his fantasies and you know, as with poor old 
Bateman, Karloff's character, he's suffering mm. one of Volin's fantasies in becoming the victim of his plastic surgery. Um, and yeah, as you say, the um, all of the mechanical contrivances that uh, are trotted out in the final act are astonishing and ludicrous. And interestingly enough, a lot of them seem to be borrowed from a film made ten years earlier, mm. which um, I, I return to having not watched it for a long, long time, simply because it's another of his old Dark House films. And I was doing some podcast prep. Yeah. And that film is The Monster from 1925. It's a horror comedy, a deliberate comedy, starring Lon Chaney. And that has a lot of the things that turn up in The Raven. So the monster has steel shutters on the windows. The monster has a cellar, which is full of all of these renegade mad doctor flourishes. But most significantly, I think, the monster has a bed that lowers the heroine through the floor. I love it. It's um, so good. So in the monster, some some arms come up around the sides of the bed and grab onto her as she's lowered, so that's horrible. In, in The Raven, you know, Dr. Volin being a dedicated man and an obsessive man, he has not only the bed to send, but the entire bedroom that Jean is in. Mm. And it's um, it's one of those moments where you think, oh, this, this film is madder than I could ever have hoped. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but it's, it's worth saying as well that um, the monster... The house in the monster was a sanatorium. Mm. So there's a kind of reason for something like steel shutters. There's a reason for, you know, a cellar full of mad science paraphernalia yeah. and all of that kind of yeah. thing. But more importantly, the monster knows it's a comedy. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's no real explanation for how Dr. Volin was able to achieve all of this. It's it's an, it, it's a slightly petty question when it comes to a film... <laughs> yes. You know, that, that was meant to be seen once in 1935 by a not terribly discerning audience, perhaps. But it's a question worth asking. How the hell did Dr. Volin fit his house up like this? Did he do it by himself? Yes. Single-handedly? <laughs> because certainly if he had accomplices, that would mean... There are, you know, there'll, there'll be witnesses to his crimes. You know, you, you can't get some builders in to construct an enormous pendulum to slice a human body open in your cellar. And yet, I don't really see how you can do it single-handedly. Oh, um, it's brilliant, isn't it? It does, it does invite rather a lot of questions. It's very true, uh, it's very true. There's some logistical... There's some logistical queries here that we've got, that's for sure. Logistical hurdles that must be overcome when we remake this. <laughs> yeah, yes. exactly. Um, I, I, I love as well, I have to say, um, how, how unstable and kind of unknowable the geography of Volin Cellars is. Yes. Because they, they do seem enormously capacious. I mean, I think one of the reasons for this is um, some of the sets were reused from Bride of Frankenstein. Mm. Um, this this may also explain why they have that uh, quasi medieval look. Yes, to them. It's, um, yes, very fantastical as as compared to what you'd expect in America at the time. But um, yeah, the the cellars seem enormous. They seem far far bigger than the house above. Mm. And it's a bit like Barbarian in that respect. Um, yes, yeah. Like, I only caught up with Barbarian a few months ago, but I was watching it thinking, oh, oh, this this is kind of like. Yeah, this this must be what it was like to see the Raven in 1939, yes. watching Barbarian. Yes, now. the levels um, of absurdity it's very, kind of ramp him up. Yeah, 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 yeah. But also just just how deeply unsettling the idea of a house with these enormously capacious tunnels and cellars mm. under it remains. Yes. Even now. <laughs> well, yeah, and actually, you know... Yes, you the, can, the, the absurdity wins. Yes, it does. I mean, and, and in a very yeah. unabsurd way, there are other movies that it reminded me of, like... Uh, I don't know if oh, you've right. ever seen Martyrs, if you've ever put yourself through Martyrs, James. No, I haven't no, yet. Well, I haven't. I, mean, I, 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 I watched, well, I watched Threads because you drew my attention oh, to God. it. Oh, God. ruined my life for a few days. <laughs> yeah. So, you know. yeah, no, um, I mean, Martyrs is maybe, maybe not quite as bad as Threads, but it's up there or down there in terms of how upsetting it is. But that is also a film in which a seemingly normal modern home has a hidden uh, a hidden vast huge torture chamber and co- sort of maze of torture corridors underneath mm. it as well and it is interesting yeah, you know there are, yeah. there have been a lot of films like that over the last couple of decades and yeah that, funnily enough the raven did kind of made me think of some of these films oh. which is interesting well well if if there isn't a shot of someone weeing down their trouser leg in martyrs i think <laughs> yes exactly yeah woman who urinates on herself bless her um yes <laughs> um yeah i mean 
it's a it's a very very fun film and and i and i liked all of the wackiness of the the moving elevator room at the end and the walls closing <laughs> in wackiness is for perfect yeah it's right. great fun it's yeah. great fun and it gets in and out it's about 60 minutes or 61 minutes or something isn't it as well and again i kind of i i respect it for that oh well if 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 you saw it in the uk on its original release it was cut very heavily by um <laughs> The census, so it, it it was clocking in at under an hour, um, and I think I think that will have been true of a lot of states in America. You know, local state censor boards who would take the scissors to films to yeah. delete things considered objectionable within those geographical parameters. It's um, yes, based on some of my reading. There are certain well, there were certain edits of this film done at the time which don't survive now, but where you you barely saw any of the torture devices. Right, you know, pe- people were so up in arms about you showing the pendulum swinging over Samuel S. Hines. Mm. And I would love it if one of these prints was to resurface yeah. of the cut versions <laughs> of films of this nature, because I, I cannot conceive how you could make <laughs> yeah. a coherent film where the big payoff, the pendulum swinging, yes. isn't really yes. inserted. Very it's bonkers. Strange. Anyway, that's a side. And, and actually, the, 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 um. <laughs> I do think those scenes are good. I mean, you know, I think it's more effective in Roger Corman's Pit and the Pendulum, but I do think that the oh, the definitely. Pendulum scenes yeah. in this are still done pretty effectively, you know, and you can imagine that they were pretty disturbing for an audience at the time, you know, and I do, I do think all of that stuff is, is pretty, yes, is pretty yeah. good, pretty successful. Yeah. yeah. I mean, the, the big problem, but also the fascination of The Raven, is all of this does sit within that default setting of absurdity, which ramps up and up and up as we get to the finish line until, you know, you, you, you've been brought to an absolute pitch of hysteria <laughs> yeah. in, in, in the last few minutes when, when Lugosi is flinging his arms around and cackling and you're thinking, what what planet have we strayed onto? Mm. I mean, I'm not unhappy here, but it's very, very odd. Um, yeah, yeah. And yeah, I, 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 I still have no idea to what extent this film is in on the joke. Yes. Um, well, I mean, there are a couple of it, things. Kind of, there are a couple of instances. I mean, the the, the kind of like sort of silly you know, sort of moment at the end where you've got the colonel and his wife still asleep in bed afterwards and things. It, it sort of, that makes me think they are sort of, they are treating it almost as a comedy in places. But I don't know. I don't know if Bella Lugosi was doing that necessarily. Well, it's hard to know, isn't it? No, I, I, I don't think for a moment Bela Lugosi was. Um, and... I think, actually, that thing you bring up about the colonel and his wife, I think that, to me, is emblematic of why this film does feel out of control. Mm -hmm. Because we're asked to believe that Dr. Volin, in the words of Judge Thatcher, is stark, staring mad. And yet, to me, all of the supporting characters, all of the people invited to this party... They, they have such a wraparound weirdness about them that they seem as mad, if not more mad, than Dr. <laughs> yeah. Volin. I, I, I would say Dr. Volin is a functioning madman, whereas these people are... <laughs> I, I, they're, they're like sort of rejects from PG Woodhouse. I don't. I don't, I don't <laughs> yes. And I, I think I think they're there for stock purposes. They're there to provide comic relief. They're not fully fleshed out characters. They're a bunch of character actors in old Hollywood doing turns. Yeah, absolutely. But they they don't give a very good support to this idea of Doctor Volin being uncontrollably insane when they seem much more. Mm-hmm. unhinged maybe it's just me maybe it's just me <laughs> but no, um, no, i know what you mean you know, i know what you mean there is a kind of that there's a level of kind of absurdity to even those characters isn't there yeah. it's it's an out of control character comedy i think yes <laughs> it's funny but i don't think it's funny in the way it's meant to be i mean i i think of that exchange earlier where um pinky is saying you know i like horses i grew up with them <laughs> and then the colonel's wife's retort is yes i can see that when i look at you <laughs> And no one responds, no one laughs, no one really acknowledges this has been said. Like, what, a, what, a, what a way for people to behave. I love it. Why can't you, why can't you just memorise the raven, read the pit and the pendulum once or twice and then build some torture devices in yes. the cellar? Why can't yes, you, exactly. Why can't you function in that way? But yeah, you're right. You know, there um, is this element as well. That these <laughs> characters are very thinly drawn, but there are, it then brought to mind other movies, the sorts of things I'm going to do in the next couple of weeks, whether it's, you know, Cat and the Canary or And Then There Were None, these movies where you do get a bunch of, bunch ah, of people yes staying yeah. together in a house and some bad stuff starts happening to them you know and uh, there's an element eccentrics. of that eccentrics yeah. exactly yeah. yes but it but it but it's i don't know it's all mm. a bit thin in this movie i suppose isn't it in terms of those eccentric yeah. characters I, yeah i mean the thing that's less thin is 
as you've already mentioned, the Looney Tunes torture devices. Um, so good. Yeah. I think I think I think it's a reason why Boris Karloff again criticizing this film said, um, here was an attempt to pile on the frills without much logic. <laughs> you know, yes. he, he did have a point. Um and they're they're quite exciting, aren't they? I mean, it has to be said they're not perfectly achieved or no. that creatively filmed. I I'm I'm always a bit annoyed by the cutaway shots to the pendulum because it seems to me they didn't have enough coverage. So you have shots dropped in of the pendulum, and it's at a different height every time. It, it yes, completely yes. defies this idea that there's a you know a ticking clock and Judge Factor is getting closer and closer to his doom. But um, you know it's good to see it, and it's um it's a sort of standout bit of old Hollywood set design. Um, and yeah, of course the the room where the walls come together, it's again not particularly imaginatively. Mm. handled mm. you know it could have been really really suspenseful but we just cut to you know the couple in there sort of holding each other and saying oh there's nothing we can do it's like, oh, right, fine. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, but then then you get that wonderful payoff shot where Bela Lugosi is trapped in there and um, again showing he's playing this part with no irony and no mm. subtlety or reservation in any way he, he runs towards the camera and he looks genuinely harrowed um, and he screams and covers his face and flops down and yeah he's 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 there being crushed absolutely crushed the only yeah. person in this film apart from Bateman to die and Bateman only dies because he deliberately sacrifices himself to kill Bela Lugosi's character Dr. Volin so um and yeah again again the, this this film's weird out of control character comedy Bela Lugosi is in there being crushed to death Samuel S. Hines' character, Judge Thatcher, has very nearly been sliced by a pendulum. And then you have this bizarre business of saying, oh, we've forgotten the Colonel and his wife. And yes. you just cut to them upstairs, <laughs> having a snooze. Very and, strange. And then, you go to the, and then you go to the scene in the car at the end, where they're, you know, it's um, Gene and Jerry, Yes, we assume, driving away from the house. And they don't seem at all phased by this trauma <laughs> they've just been through. This this thing I would need a lifetime of therapy to even start to come to terms with. Um, I think I think I think. Um, yeah, G- Gene says, "Poor Bateman, he gave up his life." And then Jerry says, "Yes, he saved us from being crushed." And then he sort of embraces Gene and says, "I think I better finish the job." Yes. Eh? <laughs> yes. Like, oh my I god. Um, but but again again it's that stock thing of a studio feeling they had to mm. give an audience moments of comic relief and moments of levity in order to try and convince them they hadn't just witnessed Bela Lugosi torturing people in a dungeon with absolutely no irony. <laughs> um, and again, it has to be said, it's one of the reasons J- James Whale's films have aged so incredibly well, in that he makes the comedy elements part of an integrated whole rather than these bits of weirdness yes. dropped in, as they are in The Raven, which I don't think lessen or deaden the film's fascination for me, but they, they do arguably undo the effect it was driving. Agreed. Agreed. Um, I, I'm I'm very glad to have seen it, though. I did have a lot of fun watching it, I've got yes. to say. Oh, Both these yeah. films made me, mo- made well, me is, laugh out loud yeah, multiple times. Yeah. Um, maybe in different ways, yeah, but yes. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, I can't emphasise enough how much The Raven is the Bela Lugosi yes. show. And... It, it has. It's it's the film you need to see in order to understand Bela Lugosi. Yes. <laughs> for me, it it is him off the leash. It is him calling all the shots. It is him having the time of his life. And I don't think it's his greatest performance. I I, I think Son of Frankenstein mm. is better acting. Mm. But there he is doing something which is not typical of Lugosi. But he's transforming. Yeah. That's much more what Boris Karloff did. And. Lugosi is also wonderful in The Black Cat, although there he's rather sympathetic. Yes. Which, again, yeah. is not typical of Lugosi. But this is Lugosi playing the maddest of all of his mad doctors. Mm-hmm. That is a sight to see. And when I say the maddest of all his mad doctors, you have to consider Lugosi was later to do films like The Devil Bat, where he invents a shaving lotion that a gigantic killer bat <laughs> he has created in his lab homes in on and kills the wearers of. <laughs> 
The Raven feels more insane than that. I, I think it could be the maddest Doctor in film history. And I love but I'm I, I'm in no way making fun of Bela Lugosi because, uh, you know, as when we discussed the Black Cat, I really do revere him as an artist. Yeah, yeah. I uh, I think one of the things you asked me in the run up to this was, do I have any favourite bits or favourite moments in this film? And I think my cheat answer to that is, I really like the bit where Bela Lugosi says the word torture. <laughs> torture. Yeah, have a drink every time Bela says torture in this oh, film. <laughs> all seven hundred times he says the word torture. But I don't think any other actor in history. Is you know would 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 ever be capable of saying the word torture and wringing every possible expressive possibility from it? Yes, you know, he plays the word torture like jazz. Yes, um, I'm especially fond um, of all of the cherishable Legosi moments in this. Of the moment where he's he's first um, tied Judge Thatcher under the pendulum and set it off swinging. It's one of my favourite dialogue exchanges in all of 1930s horror cinema. So, <laughs> and again, I think it gets at um, this film as, you know, being a horror comedy that isn't 100% aware it's a horror comedy, but you can you can never quite put your finger on it. So um, Judge Thatcher looks up, says, what's that thing? And then Dr. Volin's re- rejoinder comes, a knife. <laughs> well, what's it doing? Descending. What, what are you trying to do to me? Torture you. <laughs> and then, and then the key line. Oh, try to be sane, Volin. <laughs> try to be sane, Volin. And then Baylor goes here's one of his most wonderful speeches, where he says, uh, "I am the sanest man who ever lived, but I will not be tortured. I tear torture out of myself by torturing you. That's right, yeah. Oh. What does that even mean? I'm in heaven. <laughs> I'm in heaven. I don't know. And, you know, as as with Dr. Volin's scheme seeming rather aimless, um, <laughs> I, I'm, 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 I'm not sure the script writer knew. I'm not sure. I, uh, I think Baylor goes at least 40 knew. But, yes, um, yeah. I don't know. I uh, Yeah, I mean, the closest you can get to understanding Dr. Volin's scheme such as it is, is he's just a really nasty bastard. Yeah, basically. Um, he just loves He's decided, people. if I kill... If I kill everyone, I will feel all right about not being with the person I fancy I love, even though I love no one but myself. Yeah. That's yeah. it. Yep, yeah, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. That's it. But, Brilliant. um... Oh, yeah, that, that scene with Judge Thatcher versus... Dr. Volin under the pendulum. It's just a delight. <laughs> you have you have one of the most sedate actors in cinema history, Samuel S. Hines. Mm. He's so sedate he's Jimmy Stewart's dad in It's a Wonderful Life. <laughs> yes. Versus one of the most baroquely flamboyant actors or personalities <laughs> film has ever seen. Bela Lugosi. <laughs> magnificent. magnificent. Um, well, there you go. Well, that is uh, The Incredible The Raven from 1935. How do you think mm. it holds up, James, watching it now? I think it's aged really surprisingly well. Mm, um, mm. Certainly scenes like the pendulum scene I've just talked about, they are for me the sort of thing for which cinema was invented. That's what I go to see. But, I mean, the, the Raven, I think, has to be viewed through the same kind of lens through which we view James Wan's sillier horror films. Exactly, yes. For me, it's sort of like the malignant or the Megan of its time. Yes, yeah. It's that beautiful thing especially in a cinema, where you're in equal parts laughing at and with the film. Mm. And you're never 100% what it wants you to be doing or what it intends you to be doing at any one time, yeah. or whether the film even really cares. Yes, I don't think the makers of The Raven cared as long as you had a brilliant time with it. And you can still mm. do that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, perfectly put. Couldn't agree more. Um, well, there you go. What a fun pair of films to discuss oh, back to back. Yeah, absolutely. Heavenly. Especially after something as dark and kind of impenetrable as something like, you know, that Nosferatu and Vampire, you know, th- these two movies, um, <laughs> you know, a lot of a lot of fun, you know, well, that's what's well, been really nice. Well, the sad thing about the Nosferatu Vampire episode we did was there wasn't any reason to do voices. <laughs> well, exactly 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 um yeah so i've i've absolutely loved this james as always it's been such a pleasure having you uh on thank you so much and uh just remind people where they can find you out there in you know online and you know i by the sounds of it there's not much that you can talk about right that people should be keeping an eye out for no i, I, I can talk about the odd thing that's now viewable online because i think since the last time we spoke um 
that horror short The Thing That Ate The Birds has dropped on YouTube. Oh, yes. So so anyone who cares can watch that. Um, another horror yes, short. which is fantastic. I've seen it. It's absolutely fantastic. Oh, and it's oh, very creepy. Yeah. Yes, yeah. yeah, yeah. Very, very good. And you, can, you yeah. can see it for no money, which, as a Yorkshire man, is my very favourite price. Um, <laughs> oh, and also, I, I, I have to say, Frankenstein's Creature is now much more widely available to stream. Yes. Um, yes. It was in a slight no-man's land for a while, but um, now... In the US and the UK, you can get it on Amazon Prime, you can get it on Apple TV, and I believe just in the US you can get it on Tubi TV, Tubi TV, I'm not yes. entirely sure how it's pronounced, but it's on there. Um, so if anyone's vaguely interested in that, um, it's out yes. there for your perusal. Brilliant, fantastic. Well, James, thank you so much for joining me. It's been wonderful. And if they want to come and pick your brain about, uh, you know, v- vintage horror movies or anything else, where can people find you online? Uh, Twitter is generally the best place. Musk or no Musk, I am not being kicked out of that particular house just yes. yet. Yes, yes. Um, so my handle there is James C. Swanton. Um, I'm also on Instagram. I think I think it's the same handle. Also on Facebook, I think yet again, predictably, the same <laughs> handle. So um, Excellent. these are the avenues. Excellent. Well, James, thank you so much for joining me. Absolute pleasure, Mike. Thank you for having me. And that's it for this week. Thank you so much for listening. And one more time, a huge thank you to my brilliant guest, James Swanton. Always such a treat to have James on the podcast. So please do drop me a line. Let me know what you thought of this week's pair of films, uh, The Old Dark House and The Raven. I had so much fun with both these films and I would love to hear your thoughts. Please do get in touch. You can email evolutionofhorror at gmail.com. You can also find us on all the socials, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram and Letterboxd. And don't forget forget if you want to discuss this week's episode with fellow listeners there are two different places you can go you can join our discussion group on facebook or you can join the evolution of horror discord if you want to support this podcast financially and get treated to regular bonus content then sign up to our patreon patreon.com slash evolution of horror to keep up to date with any future eoh events including screenings and live podcast shows around the uk then keep an eye on our events page evolutionofhorror.com forward slash events or sign up to our newsletter evolutionofhorror.com forward slash newsletter you can find this podcast in all the usual podcast platforms and if you get a spare moment i'd be so grateful if you could drop us a little rating or review on apple podcasts as that really helps us get discovered by new listeners so on to next week then and we will move forward to the late 30s and 1940s. Next week, I'm going to be joined by Rihanna Dillon to discuss two very, very fun murder mystery whodunit classics, both set in big, old, dark houses. Next week, we'll be discussing The Cat and the Canary from 1939, followed by And Then There Were None from 1945. Cannot wait. Join us next week for all of this and more on the evolution of horror.